So welcome to a chat with Friendly Water for the World. I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, it's uh, as we're kind of on the slogging our way through slogging our way through um, our social distancing or or I hear that where that's the appropriate term now is physical distancing. I think the World Health Organization wants to encourage that. So um, because we still have an opportunity to, to socially connect and, and it's been great using tools like Zoom and other technologies to enable us to stay connected. And actually, I think it's um, in many ways a blessing in disguise because it's, I think this is a great new format for us to really stay better connected, not just with our supporters, um, but also with the folks in the field. A number of our chats, we've had several people come in, uh, dial in from Tanzania and Congo and India. And it's really great being able to see them and, and hear how things are happening in their countries. And, and uh, you know, it, it just makes the world kind of a smaller place, which is, which is really neat. So welcome to chat with uh, Friendly Water for the World. Um, as always, our mission is to expand global access to low cost clean water technologies and information about health and sanitation through knowledge sharing, training, applied research, community building, peacemaking, and efforts at sustainability. And our vision, which is actually, let me just move this here. Our vision is for the, of a healthy, self-sustaining, empowered, peaceful communities, both here and abroad, sharing knowledge with each other, uh, with life and hope restored through clean water. So today we are going to, there we go. Uh, Peter doesn't know that I just stole this picture off his Facebook page because I didn't have a picture of him. And I'm sure he's, I'm sure, I hope it's an excellent picture. He's very handsome in this picture. I think you'd all agree. So I hope that uh, he approves of me uh, doing that. Um, Peter is joining us to talk about perma gardens. He is the expert in that field. He's been in Africa for 20 years. Um, he uh, really knows all the inside and outside of permagardens. I was reading kind of the um, USAID has a manual on permagardens and Peter was um, crucial in helping put that together. There's really no one you'd want more to speak about this subject than him. So I'm going to um, get out of this part of the presentation and uh, I'll start his up here. And we'll let him speak once I get that going. If I can find it. Oh, one second. While uh, Will is getting that sorted out, I'd like to ask a simple question to, for you all to think about. What is the possibility of rain tonight? You're getting hard to hear. Oh. What is the possibility of rain tonight? Where? Mm -hmm. Anywhere in the world. What's the possibility? Zero. Lots of rain today in our bit of New Zealand. Right. <laughs> now compare that to what the what is the possibility? The possibility of rain is one hundred percent wherever you are. Right. One hundred percent possibility. Now, what is the probability? That depends on your weather forecasting, science, the prevailing weather conditions, but the possibility of rain is 100%. Same reason, the same thing about what is the possibility that you'll get into a car accident next time you drive a car? The possibility, 100%. The probability can be lower based on what you do to mitigate the chances, the proper vehicle, wearing a seatbelt, good vision, good eating, all those things we do to mitigate the possibility of an accident. And that's why we wear our seatbelts, because the possibility of an accident is 100%. So just like that with the rain, in our times of climatic insecurity, the possibility of rain is 100%. And the trick here is that we are trying to help people adapt to that changing possibility of rain through a perma garden and be able to catch it whenever it falls. Because in 
unstable climates across Africa, Asia, Latin America, wherever we've done this kind of work, including here on Cape Cod, uh, for those of you in New Zealand, Wales, uh, Western, Western U.S., Washington, et cetera, we don't really know it's going to rain for sure. But we want to be able to catch all of it and put it in the ground. Peter, you'll need to speak up a little bit. Okay. I will move a little bit closer. That works. Okay, I'll move closer right, right like this. Now, another question. Consider yourself, you're a farmer. What are you worried about? There are two things. Every farmer, and think about what a farmer does. The farmer grows crops. And why do they grow crops? Because they want to go to the market and earn an income. So a farmer's two biggest worries are, is it going to rain? They're worried about the weather and they're worried about the market prices. Now, next question is, what are the two things a farmer cannot change? The weather and the global market prices. Unless we come along with a method where that farmer can learn through a garden that teaches resilience, that allows them to learn how to adapt their environment to put the water into the ground whenever it does rain and hold that water for the long term throughout the growing season. Therefore, they, we can eliminate the worry about the weather and provide that farmer and that gardener with a chance to target they're growing according to when the market prices are even higher. So we start in the garden, but we always are thinking about the opportunity for agricultural advancement, larger scale farming, crop marketing, and ecosystem resilience. So the, the, the topic of today is, as you see, permagardens, we're, we're teaching family empowerment through resilience. And I know the good great pleasure of working with uh, several of your friendly water groups across Uganda, Rwanda, and recently in Tanzania last year to begin teaching this idea through your uh, water groups, the ones that are making the biosand water filters and tanks, etc., cetera, uh, doing great, great work and building this kind of water tank that you see right in front of you. That garden, that's a perma garden, a larger one in Tanzania. Uh, I'm an agroecology and permagarden training specialist. I'm a consultant now, but I've worked with the Peace Corps as a global permagarden training specialist at different NGOs uh, across Africa, Asia, and Latin America since about 2000. And before that, I was a West Virginia County Extension agent all through the 90s, where I taught the Master Gardener program. And I've always had an affinity for gardening as the way forward to teach better agriculture and better environmental management. We can, can, we can, we can change the climate if we think about which climate we're talking about, the one below our feet, like in that garden you see right there. Okay, Will, next slide. So, Terra firma permagardens, uh, it's a, it, to give a, a quick definition, there's a lot of words up there. I'm not gonna go through all the aspects here, but it is their small scale, high yield, climate smart, nutrition focused, water saving, gender engaging home gardens. And we start with that little thing you see in the right hand corner that's called a keyhole garden. That's a quick early lesson on how to capture water off of a point source of a roof or a pathway and focus the water down into a hole and that can expand into the larger gardens you see in the background of that particular picture. But we're all, the terra firma literally means a foundation of nutrition security. Terra firma, if you know, is Latin for solid earth, firm ground. That's what this is. It's a foundational process that once the process is learned, families can then use that process, those skills they've gained, in any particular landscape they may come across. And that's to create a perma garden, which is literally is a permanent garden, uh, blended permaculture with biointensive gardening. 
We'll go through each of those aspects throughout this presentation, but they're small in size, but they're high in yield. What does climate smart and nutrition focused mean? But really, it's all about saving the water. You can't begin to be nutrition focused unless you are saving the water properly in the soil, in this case, or of course, as well as the tanks that um, Friendly Water is also promoting the construction of. So these go hand in hand with the, the work that Friendly Water is doing around the world, uh, which is fantastic work. Next slide. So I mentioned that I was an agroecologist and briefly what that means is it's a blending of four disciplines that you see in front of you. Agriculture with environment, with the health and education all coming together in that one central piece where all those intersect is the environmentally sound, economically viable, healthy living ecosystem, which is the perma garden classroom. So ag works with environment and environment works with agriculture but what holds them really together is the vision of public health, nutrition security, household sanitation, water and hygiene, and the education aspect that comes in from an adult and a youth perspective. So agroecology is not one of the four, it's all of the four, a study of the blending of all four of those disciplines. And the perma garden is that classroom that we can create. Next. Throughout uh, my, my many years of doing uh, extension work and behavior change uh, across the world and from West Virginia to Massachusetts to Ethiopia and beyond, good, good ideas fail all the time. Now, why do good ideas fail? They're, in looking back to the studies of sociological research on why good ideas, good technologies fail, it's for any one of those five reasons on the left. The idea was far away from the from the beneficiary, something was imported, uh, material was a synthetic, or the idea was static, it was large and it was difficult. So any one of those five things. So if we want a good idea to succeed, we need to be the opposite of why they fail. And if that's where the rule of close comes in. So every single action that we teach in a permagarden training applies this rule. Every single thing we do, is close to the home or close to the point of daily observation and contact for the beneficiary, whoever that might be. Whether it's a farmer, a gardener, or a teacher, or a clinician, what is close from their perspective? Not ours as trainers, but theirs as the eventual doer. Local, locally as accessible materials, not just available, but accessible organic waste. The first concept, the first action is small in size and it's easy in terms of actual activity, easy to understand, see it, do it, and even then teach it. And if all five of those are in place, all five, we have this symbol. That follows the rule. So if our actions are not close, we don't even start because any one of those is missing. You can have a great idea that's local, organic, small, and easy. But if it's far from home and our target is a mother who, or, a, or, a, or a father who can't leave the home site, because of perhaps a, a pandemic or because of problems with their health. It's far away. Doesn't matter if it's local, organic, small and easy. If it was far, the idea will fail in terms of his or her ability to adopt. So this rule is all about attitude change. It doesn't mean behavior change. It means that if we can say the action was close, local, organic, small and easy, the person say, yes, I can do that. Then it's up to them to actually do it. And that is behavior change. First, you have to have attitude, then behavior. So that's a foundational aspect of the trainings that we do with terra firma. Next slide. There's a lot on this chart, but I want to make sure we're all up to speed on the fact when we hear about stunting, underweight, and wasted. I'm not going to go through everything. But what we see on the left hand on, on, the, on the axis is percentage of all children in a, in, a, in, a, in a country, in an area, and along the bottom are the various time, is the various time from birth through 60 months of age. And you'll notice that the red, the blue line is number of stunted children. Now, 
there might be 15% of children who are born stunted because of poor maternal health, poor prenatal care, but with good exclusive breastfeeding, notice the columns along the bottom, with good exclusive breastfeeding, those, those percentages drop. The st number of stunted children drops, uh, underweight children drops, even wasted children drops because of exclusive breastfeeding. But look what happens between six months and 24 months of age. Just when a child needs to be getting good complementary weaning foods, high nutrient density, protein, carbohydrates, good clean water, good sanitized household, the number goes from 5% to 10%, way up to 50%. And by the time they reach 24 months of age, if we haven't corrected those problems, those children will be stunted the rest of their life. Once you are two years old, even maybe three years old, you cannot reverse the causes of the effects of stunting. And that's really what we're targeting is the nutritional status of children in those first 1,000 days, which is a common global public health initiative that you may have all heard about. But through the Garden approach and clean, sanitized, sanitary landscapes and clean, healthy water every single day, we can bring that blue line down. That's our window of opportunity to really tackle that problem. We still want to feed high school students and adults. We're not abandoning that, but we cannot reverse the problems of stunting after the age of three years old. It's, it's, it's an irrelevant thing. And once you're set, once you're stunted, you are stunted. We can reverse it between six and 24, but not after that. So, that's why the value of a home garden, the perma garden is a home based garden, allowing children, mothers to provide daily nutrition security every single day. That's the problem with nutrition versus crop growing for farmers. Gardening and nutrition is an every single day activity versus seasonal, which is agriculture and farming. Okay, just want to make sure we're up to speed on what we're really targeting. And the essential nutrition actions which we're getting after here, this is also from just general public health knowledge, is that we can tackle these four dominant nutrition essential actions. Nutrition from adolescents and women during pregnancy and lactation, complementary feeding starting at six months with continued breastfeeding, prevention and control of anemia, prevention of vitamin A deficiency. That comes through the planting of nutrient-dense high iron and vitamin A rich crops in the garden on a sequential basis. And we can do that sequentially because it all goes back to the water. We've put the water in the ground. Whenever it rains, you've got it, you control it. You don't have to worry so much about the weather because you have the holes and the berms and the swales and the double dug beds that are gonna hold the water throughout the the dry periods in the rain, as well as into the dry season, where you can still be able to plant these various fruits, grains, and legumes. So these are the targets we're after, uh, and this is how we're going to do it. Next slide. This is the the six S's of water management. Now you can think about what does six S say that several times. Six S, six S, six S. You are saying the word success. And that those words are right in front of you. Stop it, slow it down, let it sink so it can spread in the soil and you can save it in the subsoil in what's called subsoil moisture recharge. And then the shade is the shade of the canopy of leaves over the soil itself. Not a shade structure over the garden, but a shade of the canopy of leaves over the soil. And that keeps the soil water within that particular climate. So that's our design aspects and those are some of the swales and berms that you see created in the construction of a perma garden. Next. This is something that I usually spend in a training about an hour and a half on, so <laughs> we don't have that kind of time. But again, it goes back to the idea of our actions within the existing climate, which is the blue lines. On the lower right, you see it says low, the long rain season begins. That's just the normal climate in that particular area. And then it's, that's the first season, three or four months of rainy season. That's the time when people will plant 
leaves, grains, and legumes in a normal farming cycle. And then the next two months when the rains end is when they begin to harvest. And the soil at that point is wet, but it's becoming the dry season. And then it goes into a long dry season all the way until the rains come again in maybe eight to nine months later. That's the current climate. But we go back and before the long rains begin, we create the garden, create the beds and the swales in the proper fashion before the rains begin. The rains hit and that water goes in, is held in the subsoil, and we create that middle brownish blue, uh, blue red arrow called the new wet dry season. And that allows us to get a second or even a third crop because of the work that was done at least a month or two before the rains hit in the area. So it's a matter of timing about when we want to create these gardens. But this goes into the management sequence of the permanent garden training and design aspect. We create the garden beds and swales before the rains begin so that people can watch the water go into the holes and get that particular aha moment. Dug a hole, water went in it, and it slowly sank. We're not creating a pond of water that they can dip into with a bucket. We're creating a healthy soil that will hold the water throughout this new wet dry season. So it's still the dry season above our head, but it's the wet season below our feet. And that's how we create seasonal resilience. Next. So part of the, uh, what goes along with the, the water management system, the burns and swales and holes that are part of the design, it's also deeper digging with local carbon amendments, what we call double digging. Double digging literally means digging twice, but with that we're going down within the layers of soil, topsoil to subsoil, really doing it thoughtfully, not just, it's not just a, a, a cookbook, go 12 inches, then another 12 inches. It depends on the existing soil quality or lack thereof, depending on where we go. So by double digging, we are increasing all of that below. The density of plants, the health of plants, the interception of the sun, carbon dioxide capture, retaining the moisture, increasing the microbial life, all of that combines to increase yield by as much as six to 800% per square meter. Now that's not immediate, that's within a couple of years of good management. You can't just create this thing and then walk away and expect it all to work beautifully. Of course, it's a living, breathing, organic system that has to be managed. That's also part of the training we provide is how do you manage this thing once you make it? It's a bit like the, the water tanks and the water filters. You can make a beautiful water filter, but if people don't know how to manage it or maintain it, it'll fall apart, it'll break. Like any good house will eventually break if we don't maintain it, clean it, same with the garden. It's a little more fragile when you talk about soil, and environmental systems, you have to be a little, bit, a little bit better at the management, of course, any gardener will tell you. So it's water capture and it's deep digging as the principal aspects of permagardening. Uh, next. Uh, and this is why we get this idea of the, the gardens of hope. And it's a very, it's an inspirational message for people grow more food on land they otherwise thought was impossible or a climate they thought was impossible. We can't grow things here, and yet they do. It's that sense of hope and enjoyment, and it becomes a spiritual moment for them, not a religious one, but a spiritual one. Like, look what we did. We changed this climate. Not the one over our heads, but the one below our feet. And the picture on the upper right is from last year in in uh, Shinyanga region, Tanzania, with Kennedy Mahili and his, his, his team that were doing uh, one uh, of the keyhole gardens expanding into a farm uh, uh, concept. And they're all pointing to where they want the water to go into the ground, into the hole. So this idea that it's simple, local tools, it can be easily learned and taught to others. Caregivers have a reason to be hopeful for loved ones and themselves. This is originally an idea that was started uh, in the mid 2000s around the HIV AIDS pandemic uh, in Africa and Tanzania. I was working for Peace Corps uh, and engaged as a, as a global nutrition science and security uh, program specialist, if you will, 
and develop this particular method and the model by which we teach it. That's terra firma. That's coming up in a moment. So those are the images we can see around the world as people feeling hopeful and uh, excited about the future based on eating well every day. And once lessons are learned in the garden, they can be taken to the larger field as the farmer makes that choice to do so. So it starts small, but always with the vision of expanding large if that gardener wants to move on to becoming a farmer and actually grow crops for market, for income, as well as food for the kitchen. We always start with food for the kitchen, however. Okay, next. Uh, this was one particular garden in, in uh, Jinja, Uganda, and you can see what they're from the beginning stages. The simple cracking of a hard red, highly eroded soil just to get the design started. Lower left is the towards the end of completion where it's been double dug and mulched and women are engaged in every process, every step along the way, very hands-on, very, uh, very active, three or four day training to create that space on the top left, uh, lower, the lower right, uh, complete with a living fence all the way around. So this is what, what a small group training can, can result in. And then it's up to that particular group of uh, learners to then go, go back home, create their own garden, and then be followed up with a reconnection by the field staff or by other people to check on how they did. So this was a training of trainers, if you will, but they were, they were not called trainers yet. They were just learning how to create it, but then they would go home and make it themselves and then move forward from that point. Now, next, I believe, Will, are we able to show a short video? Yes, I just have to, so let me, it's right there. Okay. Let's see what see what happens here. Yeah, this is from my YouTube channel, uh, Terraforma International. <clears throat> do you see the video, or do you still see the PowerPoint? I still see the PowerPoint myself. Okay. So let me stop here, and then I'll, uh... yeah, this also give me a chance to have a drink of water. Okay, good. <laughs> which is beautifully filtered, not by a biosan, but a Berkey filter. Boy, the Berkey filter is amazing. Oh, here we go. I'll just shut up now. Is that? Well, I don't hear any sound. Oh. Hmm. Let me. So it's a. Let me see. You may have to annotate this. I'm not sure okay. why the sound isn't coming on. I can. It's just the idea is that there you're seeing I'm pointing as to where the water is going. And that was a a small roof. It was a three meter by two meter latrine that we first saw in that first scene. And that is six square meters. And in this part of uh, northern uh, Uganda, it was in Gulu, Uganda, a couple of years back. And there was, I think it's about a thousand millimeters of annual rainfall. Just to, for mathematical sake, it's easier. That you, the millimeters of annual rainfall is a thousand. You multiply that by the square meter of roof. That means from that one small little latrine roof, 6,000 liters of water come off of the roof. And so we ask, we do that little bit of mathematics and without having this system in place right there, we, we would not put a water tank underneath a two meter by three meter roof, it's just too small. But this is that the one roof does give the example that where we can put the water is in that water tank, the soil, the permagarden you see right in front of you, that 
but not only the one roof of the latrine on the left, it's also all the roofs that are around. I mean, when you look back up, that's actually about 35 square meters of actual roof line that are now coming towards that garden. They used to all rush over that land before. It was just a giant blank space. But now the water can actually sink into that, that water tank. Whereas before, it used to rush around the house and go to that green area right there. That's still useful space. It's still green. But we want to feed this kitchen from that garden. And that's where we, we allow people to understand the mathematics of that, not because they want to know specifically how much, how many liters of water, but that if you were to ask most people in the dry season, why don't you have a garden next to your home? And they will wisely because I don't have any water. Now, by going through that little mathematical exercise, they realize that actually from one tiny two by three meter roof, they have 6,000 liters of water. And then by, uh, you can go to the next slide here while, while I talk. By, by, uh, by the, then the math, they actually have, looking at all the roofs, they have 35,000 liters of water. So people are thinking, wait, what they lack is not water, it's the management of that water. And that's a big aha moment. We, can, we can't bring water to every village in Africa. We can't give water tanks to every home in Africa, which we could. But we can bring water management skills to every single family all over the world. And that's the, the foundational concept of Terra Firma, is that through this training program, water management skills can literally go across the world because Again, the foundational rule of close. We're not going to import anything. Everything is close, local, organic, small, and easy. Therefore, neighbor can teach neighbor, can teach neighbor, on and on and on. So we're coming to this point now. Uh, I'll wrap this up as quick as I can just because I want to get to questions. This is what our training looks like. The vision, the goals, and the objectives. Uh, I've already mentioned the vision, the goals, but the objectives here is that there we create climate smart, nutrition focused home gardens. And climate smart means that we adapt, we mitigate the again, we mitigate against the severity of the climate, we intensify our production. Nutrition focused means we plant a variety of vegetables that provide go, grow, and glow nutrition. And our home garden is close, small, and easy. If we do those things, we are preparing for the climate and stop. Terra firma tasks that allow us to achieve that objective are those five things. That's terra firma. We assess our resources with we'll a landscape resource walk. We capture the resources with compost making and use. We also look at how to capture the water with swales and berms. That's under protection as well, which is water management success. We talk about production, soil health, double digging, and biointensive management. All five. Like the rule of close was all five, terra firma is all five. You can't just chop and plant and expect a beautiful salad every day. You have to assess, capture, protect, produce, and manage, and continue around the circle. So if we want to change the climate above our heads, we start by changing the climate below our feet, and below the leaf canopy of our garden beds. So that's the that's what a, a small group training of trainers would cover in broad terms. And the next slide is a more specific one. There it is again, the, the firm the assess, capture, protect, produce, and manage. Each of those different bullet points below each section are what we go through. So while the garden will look compact and, and intensive and small and, and hopefully easy to create, there's a lot of science and systems that we go through to, to discuss. And that circle with a line through it looks like a cue. It's actually the circle of sustainability that we insert ourselves at some point and then use that to spin the circle around. That's the imagery we want to have. And along the way, we understand that this is a process that we're teaching. It's not just a garden product, it's a process. The, this terra firma process can be applied to small business, to public health management, to agriculture, environment, and of course, to the perma garden. 
It's not just about making a perimeter. We have to monitor our, our actions to make sure we're doing things correctly. Doing, are we doing the things right? And then evaluation comes later. Based on that, are we doing the right things? And that leads to our impact of actual results. And that's really what Terra Firma is right there in a nutshell. Um, but each one of those topics could be the subject of about an hour and a half of conversation. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's move on. Because this is really also what it's about. But notice the centerpiece of our expanding flower. Imagine this spiraling outward. You start with the perma garden, the small doable action that anybody can create. It can be one square meter or five square meters, but it is assess, capture, protect, produce, and manage, spinning around. That allows people to grow a healthy diet, and then they can they can think nutrition education, complementary feeding, market gardening, and our first thousand days. That's within the first spinning cycle of once a permagarden is established. Once it's created, remember it's permanent, not the crops, but the structure. The work is hard in the beginning, like a foundation of a house. But once you have the foundation of your house, you don't make the foundation again. You are managing it, cleaning it, replanting it, but you're always thinking in cycles. And once you're confident in the garden, you can take it out to field crops and land husbandry activities. You can keep spinning around to youth and gender and community economic development activities and keep spinning around also to finally agroecological resilience and sustainability. And here's another circle that we go around. It starts at the top with deep soil preparation that allows the close plant spacing that creates the healthy microclimate, which is what's holding your water, your carbon dioxide, nutrients, and microbes in the soil that stimulates abundant growth, produces thriving healthy plants that feed people, and also provide organic material for compost, which is added during the deep soil preparation process. So that is our circle of sustainability. It's also in a circle. You do step by step by step by step. And then once you've done it once, you don't need to double dig again. Common misconception, once you double dug, you recreate a new soil profile, you actually do not want to dig it again. You're turning a very bad compacted soil around people's homes into a deep, loamy, rich, healthy microclimate full of water and carbon dioxide. You do not want to be digging it again. You want to make sure that it can continue to go around that circle and the cycle can continue. Um, we've lost Will. Oh. <laughs> Will's, in, Will's in Playland. Sorry, Will, next slide. Thanks. And that's, again, what it looks like. The family, there it is in a family perma garden. It can look like a circle, a keyhole, and expanding concentric bands, like a Wi-Fi signal, or this style. larger, square, rectangular, and highly, much more productive looking uh, gardening system. But it's a very, this one here is in, uh, is in Northern uh, Rwanda, a very dry area, but it's, a, it's an abundant harvest here. This has not been watered by hand. This is three months after the rains have stopped. Uh, it's had a minimal hand watering, but it's got a deep soil that's held the water in those holes and in the soil itself. So that's what the opportunity here is that permagardens can provide. It's part of the, the carbon revolution, meaning we're talking about soil health, moisture recharge, and therefore daily food security. Um, Will, next slide. We're almost at the end, because now it's time to get to work. And this is the, the training and reconnection model is the, the training aspect is people see it, they do it, and they teach it as part of the as part of a training process, three or four days. They practice it at their own home, and then they consider teaching at least two of their neighbors, not to go out and teach a workshop, but they all those women we see right there can go home and practice, and then. After proper reconnections are made by the training, the staff who we may train, train local trainers, they'll do follow-up reconnection 
and monitoring to make sure that the ladies or the gardeners are doing it correctly, that they gain confidence, they can then teach others. Again, because of the rule of close, we do not need to be thinking about importing uh, fertilizers or special seeds or uh, fertilizers or anything at all, uh, or irrigation equipment. Okay? Everything we do is rain fed. As soon as we import something, we break that rule and people say, even if it's a, a watering can, it's only $4, but we may have enough money to give 25 people a $4 watering can, but we don't have enough money to give 200,000 people a $4 watering can. If people want to make this garden and earn $4 and buy their own watering can, absolutely. That's a wonderful idea because then they've made that investment in a perfectly wonderful tool, a watering can. But we do not on purpose give anybody anything except this million dollar idea. Because this is something that that garden, once it's established, will stay there forever as long as people maintain it. And the skills they learn will maintain within them forever as long as they keep practicing. We're not giving a, 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 a tangible thing they have to pick up and bring with them. This is blends well with your, your other work you do in biosand filters uh, and water tanks which are, and rocket stoves, which are a cement and a form and a construction process and a wonderful creation, but there is more involved in actually getting that hard, hard material there. Once they have that tank or that water filter, they have to know how to maintain it. Same thing with the garden. The garden soil is softer. It's there. We fix whatever soil people have and make it the best it could possibly be. Um, so that, May well be the last slide. I can't remember. Will I have one more? My closing. Yeah, this is it. This is just who we are. This is uh, again uh, the website, uh, YouTube channel, Terraforma International. This is terraforma.com if you want to learn more about the work that I've done with Friendly Water and other groups as well. Um, I do work often with my wife, Lynn Van Norman. Uh, she's the gender engagement, impact, nutritious cooking aspect of my work. Ecology and the home garden soil science aspect of it. Uh, we do it together or we do it individually. Just, we don't have to always be together. Um, but if the, the whole idea is we want our vision is strong, active, healthy communities, same as, as yours with friendly water. And we get that with by having healthy people. Healthy people derive from healthy plants, and healthy plants derive from healthy soil. Healthy soil means it's full of air. It's full of water and it's full of carbon. Like those ladies are adding in that picture, they are physically sequestering that carbon that would have otherwise been taken away and burned. Now it's creating a sponge in the soil. And it's that small, doable action that anybody can do, which is what really is the, the visionary well, the concept, the foundational concept of terra firma, solid earth. Anybody can do this. Once they've gone through this step-by-step -step training, uh, once trainers are trained to be able to teach properly in a small, doable, activity-oriented manner. Um, I like, uh, uh, would like to give a nod to, uh, to Nancy or to Myrna, who I've had the great pleasure of working with directly uh, in a couple of, uh, couple of locations, uh, Rwanda specifically with both of them. Uh, but uh, Nancy, would you like to, you mentioned you might want to have a comment or two? happily give you that moment. Uh, friendly Water and, and Peter for your visionary leadership. Hey. Can you can oh, hear me? Nancy, I wanted to mm -hmm. mention that Emmanuel is on too. Emmanuel Men and oh, Yay. Yay. So we have one of our children yeah. from Rwanda. Um, it has been tremendously successful. I met Peter uh, through um, a post on Facebook uh, two years and four months ago. And um, since that time, we have been able, there's my trainer, Emmanuel from Rwanda, hi, um, have been able to develop <laughs> with um, in-country trainers and with Myrna going there and Peter teaching villages for us. Uh, we're approaching 65 uh, communities that have learned this and 
pretty near, um, each community has anywhere from 25 to 68 families that have dug gardens. We have a couple exceptions with a little fewer, but mm -hmm. this works. It really works in Rwanda in um, having local trainers and follow up. Um, one of the things I didn't hear Peter mention that I think has been really healthy for Rwanda is it helps build um, community. In Rwanda, they're post-genocide 26 years now, and, and having um, this strong sharing and helping each other in the garden, developing the Prama Garden, has been um, a real uh, helpful thing in our community building as well. So this really, really, really works. I'm uh, behind it a thousand percent. We have um, hundreds and hundreds of biosand water filters and lots of tanks. We've taught the people how to do all this. So it's, it's all, um, well, I love it because it's self-sufficiency. Uh, it's um, them doing their own work. It's all the principles Peter talked about in his close principles. But in my 12 years of working in Rwanda, these are the best two things that I've come upon. And um, it, it has really stood them well in this time of, um, they are tremendously locked down with the uh, virus, the pandemic, and they can't get back to their farms. So they can get to their gardens. And those that paid attention and did the work are in a much better position mm -hmm. to survive um, they have live food, they have the um, green and yellow and orange vegetables, not just the white, 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 white seem to be the diet, the rice, the spaghetti, the cassava, the white potatoes, but all this um, introducing of the high nutrient foods as well. So thank you, God bless you. I love this work, I'm devoted to it. And if there's any way we can get <laughs> Peter Jensen and Friendly Water for the World on the podium for the Nobel Peace Prize, or science or whatever, I would, I would be on the front row cheering you. I think this is the solution for our planet and how we can get it out there is, uh, is my dilemma, but I promote it and sing this song everywhere I go. So thank you, God bless you. I love this work. And yeah. Thank you, Myrna and Emmanuel. Oh, and I wanna chime in because it's really great uh, having been there with Peter and learning this technique from Peter there, you really go into, many of you have probably been in Africa where outside the homes, you, you know, the soil is compact and being a horticulturist and former, you know, Peter seeks out like the worst part of the yard you can imagine that you'd say like, they'll never grow a garden there, you know, and you get out the, um, the hose and you break it up and add the compost and it turns into a garden in the next, uh, months and so it really is an amazing process it's almost you can't believe it till you see it kind of thing but it really does work and I want to you know support uh, in any way that I can you know the uh, spreading of this technique and the teaching and I really maybe Emmanuel uh, has anything to say he's a, a tremendous permagarden teacher in Rwanda and uh, he's he's done a fantastic job working with groups there yes hello guys hi so, hello. <laughs> yeah thank you so much uh i don't have really so much to say because uh, most of the things uh peter has explained for me i would say just what has inspired me Didi Peter is a great teacher. He did amazing work just to train us. Even something you have never could imagine just could be possible. For me, the simple uh, touching point, just how to use the small plot, sometimes we don't even use, and we use it to have, the, to have food. Actually here in Rwanda, we are density population. We do have a small run. We have many members of our family and we do have to eat. But what we have to eat just coming from the farm. But the farm doesn't produce because we don't know how just to irrigate the, mm -hmm. the production because we have been farming mm -hmm. those farms for so long. So getting the techniques from Peter Jensen, it is really a turning point here in Rwanda. We can really harvest the vegetables, 
And also here, we do depend on rain. We don't have any system of just irrigation. We reach on hills. It is just a country with a thousand hills. So living on the hills, and we don't have access to water, we cannot do irrigation system. So we have to conserve the water from rain. And luckily, we get enough of water. So what we wanted to know is just how to keep the water under the soil, because even those uh, uh, tanks, everyone cannot just access the tanks. So everyone can access the soil, can access to dig down in the soil and put those uh, brown material, those compost and conserve water. So I'm really very happy that I have met the guy, I have met Peter Jensen, and I'm more happy just to continue spreading the word, to continue spreading this knowledge. And I'm very grateful to anyone who really supports the people who want to run and the people who want to change uh, this thing just of having uh, a clean environment, having access to the food. Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Emmanuel. We, we haven't yet done permagards with friendly water in India. And it was sort of interesting when I introduced the idea and explained it briefly, the first thing they came up with was, wow, in the rainy season, our roads get washed out. And then we get these big puddles that produce malaria. And so they thought of this as a way not only to produce food, but to, the lo but to lower the incidence of malaria because they said those puddles, instead of being, instead of being um, uh, uh, they're, they're a negative thing, could be turned into a positive thing. They, they, saw, they saw that idea. It was the first thing they came up with. Puddles on the road, those could be our savior rather than our problem. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's a, if those of you have access to YouTube, um, there's one of, the, one of my videos which talks about that very same thing, David. And it's about walking up the watershed and it was recently actually from the work we did in Tanzania with Kennedy out there in Shinyanga. So look for that one. It's called Walking Up the Watershed. And it starts from a puddle in the road. You know, the, the puddle in the road gets there by going and running its way through the landscape. So the way you solve that problem is not to go to the, the puddle per se, because it's already gone, but you go back up the hillside and you right. put, the, put that water into the landscape before it becomes a problem in the road. But the puddle is that indicator of the problem. But we turn problems into solutions, like those the folks in India. That's exactly what the, the, the assessment walk is. We look for challenges. And I asked one of those questions again. I said, we look for gullies. And I said, what is the bad thing about a gully? And people say, that's where all the water goes and it causes erosion. Exactly. And so I said, what's the good thing about a gully? And it's the same answer. It's where all the water goes. So that's now your point of control. You now know where the water goes and you go back up and you deflect it side to side to side. Now it's your water. You put the water in the soil, it's your water. You're, not, you're, you're stopping erosion. You're putting the water into the aquifer eventually through the subsoil. And it's in that one meter of subsoil that we're recharging that then comes back up through the process of evapotranspiration, photosynthesis, all those actions of plants. But we gotta put the water in the soil. Once it's in the soil, it's controlled. And that sense of empowerment over controlling a gully is immense what people feel, let alone smaller little pathways. They're starting out as gullies, but we make them turn a corner and simply turn a stormwater management solution from a problem to an asset uh, with swales and berms and then double dot beds. It really is, it really is that easy uh, to change the world. We just gotta change the definition of world. And the world is the world below our feet and the world outside our kitchen doors. And we can change that everywhere anywhere because of these very simple foundational concepts terra firma does, and the rule of close does anybody else have any other questions for peter i know we're going a little long on time so 
I, I, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, I've been associated and working in uh, off and on with friends in Rwanda since 2004. And I wondered if um, any of these projects yesterday, uh, uh, last week's project or this week's project have hooked up with any of the Quaker work, uh, which started out as AVP and now as HEROC and some of the other uh, work in specifically in Rwanda and Kenya and Burundi. Got it. So we are working in Rwanda with Pastor Habermana, Augustine Habermana, who is also the staff person for 17 Quaker churches in uh, southern Rwanda. We've done a training program with them on biosand water filters. We have not yet expanded to work with them on um, permagardens. Um, we have worked with HROC groups in Burundi, and we have many ties with Quakers in Western, in Western Kenya. Um, the Perma Garden work, however, has been mostly focused on, again, on Rwanda, uh, and then Uganda. Uh, in Uganda, by the way, the people who, many of the people who work on those projects, Peter doesn't know, but are members of Bulungi Tree Shade Friends Meeting, which is the only um, unprogrammed, uh, welcoming and affirming friends meetings in all of East Africa. And uh, they, but I have to tell you, they're in terrible condition right now because of what's going on. And so I talked to Helen Tanyinga just before I got on this call. They're, they're having a desperate time right now, but we have been working with them. Um, and the um, Friendly Water staff person, our program manager, is the former clerk of Young Friends of Kenya and a clerk of Kakamega. Oh, oh. Sorry, go ahead, David. Oh, that's it. Oh, was there another question from the two Elizabeths? Yes, um, I understand that with climate change in Africa, they've got a lot more drought, dry seas, that the old pattern of dry and wet season has got totally disruptive and particularly more dry seasons. Um, how is this affecting the permaculture, which was sort of based on dry and wet? Right. Well, that, that's, that's a great question. I really appreciate you bringing that up because it goes back to the idea that we can't change the climate over our heads. Uh, climate is, it's called climate change, duh, as in past tense. The climate has changed. And we have to adapt to that change. It's a new reality, like this one. We have to adapt to this public health climate. Um, mm. We have to be a part. We cannot change the fact that COVID is here. We can adapt and mitigate and intensify our work to overcome it. Same with the climate. The climate has changed. We can't go back 150 years to before the, the Industrial Revolution. We can't reverse time and gravity. What we can is to teach people how to adapt to the current climate reality, to catch the rain whenever it does fall, and to use one of my little little sayings, we want to be able to help people minimize the maximum while maximizing the minimum. So maximize the minimal rains, the little showers that come whenever they come. Well, it's now going to focus in exactly where you tell it to go. So that's maximizing the minimum. And also, minimizing the maximum deluge that's going to fall, blow people away and turn that stormwater problem into an asset by making the water turn corners and slow down. You can get, you know, 50 millimeters of rain in an hour, but if you, if you have a system in place to catch it all, it will just wind through the ecosystem and become an asset versus an erosion problem. It'll nourish the ecosystem rather than destroying it. And that all that larger scale vision we have about adapting to climate change comes by starting in a one square meter garden. You know, it's really the smallest activity, uh, a four meter by four meter perma garden. Perma gardens are not big on purpose because if you teach a big thing, it's only gonna relate to the big farmers. We, it's better to have 500,000 people creating a two square meter permagarden than it is to have 
100 people doing two acres or five acre farms because we get 500,000 activists who are charged up and ready to go and ready to teach their neighbors and two teach two teach two because nothing is imported, right? They're using only what they already have. Everything is close, local, organic, small, and easy throughout the entire system. And that is how we change the world, um, literally. It's, it's, Great. Uh, Deanna, did you want to comment? I know you've been working in southern Zambia. Uh, yes, please. Um, uh, I work with um, a charity called Friends of Monzi in southern Zambia. Um, we're working with uh, um, 10 school permaculture gardens. Um, we, we've been um, doing water harvesting and swales uh, in the gardens, but they don't s seem to have enough water to be able to grow things all year round. Well, the, the soil, um, it, it's very sandy, um, porous. I don't know if you know the area. Um, it, 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 it's like sandy rock all the way down. Um, would your system work in, in school gardens in Zambia? Yes it, yes, it would. And the reason it would, I can say that cavalierly, because the answer to every problem is carbon. <laughs> carbon More is the organic. answer. You add organic matter to any soil. If you've got compacted clay, the answer is carbon. I mean, we're talking about compost and mulches and leaves and sticks and charcoal, carbon materials. If you have a sandy soil where water goes through it, you've got to make a sponge. You've got to help hold the water. And the answer to that is carbon. Same thing. So you, a gardener uses the soil she has. A farmer on an acre will look across the field and say, there's my sandy area, there's the clay area, and they'll adjust their farming practices and crops to fit that particular soil quality or soil type. A gardener has the four square meter spot next to her kitchen and it's clay or it's sand and she wants a garden. Great, welcome to the team. Welcome to the carbon revolution. You add carbon to that sand, it'll hold water. You add carbon to that clay, it'll drain water. It's really as simple as that. It's a matter though of where do we get the carbons? What are those? How do we turn it into a soil food, a mixture that goes directly by hand into the subsoil? How do we make it into compost? They're two different things. It's building a level of of comfort with managing their carbon, which most people in Zambia and Malawi, I lived in Malawi for six years and I've been in Zambia often, they sweep, sweep, sweep all that nasty carbon waste and they burn it. And that's not adding carbon to the atmosphere to any large degree. What they're doing though, it's not, that's not affecting climate change. It is taking away their best weapon against climate change by burning all the carbon. Yeah, right. we we do teach not to do sweeping. Good. Um, but Good. You, you're saying we need to put carbon in as well as compost. Right, compost is just one version of, car of, of carbon. Compost is actually a product, brown, green manure water mixed together that rots down into a product after three or four months. That's a nutrient dense structural additive to a soil. It's an actual product, compost. But the raw carbons like leaves and sticks and grasses and charcoal, we add a little water to that and that can be added directly by hand into the subsoil as a, a subsoil strata that acts like a sponge and slowly breaks down over time. We don't add that to the topsoil though, it's only to the subsoil. The compost three months later is then added to the garden for the next cropping cycle. Because this is a permanent gardening system, that's meaning the structure is the same, but the management continues. Every three months, you're renovating the beds, you're adding compost that you made three months ago. Now it's three months later, now you add it again. It's around the cycle, you see, it's gardening as a process. You're regardless of the climate over your head. In a way, you have to, you have to manage that too, in terms of when you plant certain things, but you can take the, the nine month dry season of Zambia and actually shorten that to about a two month at the end of the dry when it really is too dry, 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 dry. But 
you can do a lot to turn a three month growing season into a 10 month growing season. And that's the game changer. That turns people from being food insecure to being food secure and taking money to the bank and doing and maybe making that choice of yes now i want to invest in my own water tank you know because they have now the money to go buy cement and ferro cement tanks and they can make their own based on their own choice based on good training they've had they can make their own bio sand water filter because the money they have in the bank right they can go buy whatever they want so it really comes down to carbon wise use of the carbon resources that are lying all around and there is one motto that I have in my Terra Firma international organization that I'm consulting is we arrive with people's lives in pieces all around. We leave with people's lives in peace upon the ground. So from pieces to peace. And that's the feeling of, wow, look what I did. I changed my world with the pieces that were lying all around. And that those pieces are the carbon. Those pieces are the community members that Nancy was referring to, the friends and neighbors from different situations and backgrounds coming together. That's peace and harmony. That's what you are all what do you do. Oh. It, it, so. it sounds great. I, I can't wait to try it. It works. <laughs> Uh, any... Deanna, I welcome you to look at the website and reach out to me on uh, on email with any questions. Happy I'm going to. to. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody Thank else you. anybody else have any comments or questions? Okay. Um, Thank you so much, Peter, David, like Willis here. Uh, wow, uh, great presentation. I'm sorry I came a little late to it, but now to get to the garden. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming. David, did you have any parting words? Just thank you all for coming. Um, uh, next week, I think I'm getting to talk about India. Wow. And, and yes. efforts in India that are underway these days. Um, uh, uh, that should be fun. Uh, you know, I've been going back and forth to India for 44 years. Hmm. Oh, that's a long time. And, wow. Uh, I look forward. I look forward to that one. Please come, invite your friends. Um, as I always say every week, we're very open to your donations. Uh, you know, like all other uh, NGOs, we struggle at this particular time, and the need is very, very great. So I don't want to discourage you from giving funds locally to groups that really need it, but save a little bit for the rest of the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, Thank you. Great weekend. See you, Emmanuel. Thanks, Will, David, everybody. Right, Thank you. Bye bye. Is, is this Bye-bye. recorded and archived? Is it is. It's re- it's reco- it's recorded, and I'll send out an email with the link to the recording. Nice. Thank you. Very nice. A lot of people Thank wanted you. to get on, so we'll make sure they get it. Bye bye. Absolutely. Good to meet you, Emmanuel. Yeah. Thank you, Emmanuel. For I really appreciate you staying up late, Emmanuel. You were yeah. a tremendous trainer and a great advocate uh, and a fantastic yoga teacher, by the way, everybody. Yeah. Uh, this, man, this man's brilliant. So yeah. your kind words were really, I'm, a, I'm asleep well tonight, my friend. And Nancy, great to see you. And thanks for your cheerleading always. Oh, uh, I'm your yeah. cheerleader. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she is. You did, did a great job. Right. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you thanks. for saying. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Thank you, David. Bye, Emmanuel. Bye. Emmanuel, be strong and safe out there. We're thinking of you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. How do I leave?